All right, so let me begin by prefacing that I'm more interested in how this impacts aesthetics, ironically enough, because again, wh what quine means for other fields is still hotly disputed, but there's no doubt it has very vast implications beyond philosophy to logic, mathematics, and a lot of adjoining fields. But how far we should take them, we're not clear. And as we're going to see in the conclusion, it's a very still controversial argument. So Two Dogmas, I think, was published in a way to be a friendly criticism to positivism. Now, what is positivism? Um, posit positivism is really hard to define, but I would define it as the attempt to find a logical foundation for all disciplines. All disciplines, but primarily mathematics and logic, and try to reduce philosophy to a sort of branch of logic that would sort of structure the other disciplines. And Quine is going to try to show that this task is just impossible, given the limitations of language in our cognitive systems. Now, this might seem a tautology, but as he shows, even their own arguments really just beg the question and show us that they just are not going to be able to be capable of what they say they think they can do. So the first argument is really powerful and really simple. He says, when we look at any kind of everyday term, whether cereal boxes, cats, dogs, cities, you name it, how do we know what they mean. And we think, obviously, well, we run to the dictionary, we define things like a bachelor is defined as unmarried, and that's how we know what it means, right? Um, and But he says, well, what really think we think is going on here is that we already have an implicit div division between the analytic and synthetic from the years of human Kant. Uh, very quickly, an analytic statement should be 1 plus 1 equals 2. It's just true by virtue of its terms versus an empirical claim or synthetic claim, such as Winston Churchill led the British people and, you know, time period X, that's an empirical claim, that's synthetic, that's true by the way facts are in the world, but what he wants to show is that it's not really possible to partition these two. And what he says is using the notion of salve vortate, is that when we think that synonyms can retain truth value, it's not true. So take an obvious case like 1 plus 1 will equal 2, and 2 will equal 1 plus 1. Yes, no truth value is sacrificed, but when we start using other kind of statements, we find that truth value cannot be maintained. So if we take somebody like Kant and say Kant is defined as a philosopher, but not all philosophers are defined as Kant. And we say, well, let's switch around the meanings. We'll say Kant is defined as a knowledge seeker, and all knowledge seekers are defined as Kantian. And we can still sort of get around that. But when we think it through, it's not going to work because let's take something like ducks or platypuses. Couldn't they be seeking knowledge in a certain way? So if we say the duck is a knowledge seeker, we can definitely say that, but are they Kant or are they human? The answer is no. So it looks like synonyms are sort of parasitically feeding on the empirical reality. We know what an unmarried person is, not by the term, but what we know in terms of reality. So there's no way to necessarily keep the truth value in all statements. There's going to be some slippage between the various truth values of various statements, even for the same term, right? So you can have an unmarried man, but the unmarried man is not necessarily a bachelor, but a bachelor will necessarily be an unmarried man, right? Because an unmarried man be might be on the way to be married, but not be married at that time, and therefore be classified as unmarried, but they wouldn't be called a bachelor, they're just about to be married. So there's going to be a lot of tricky cases, and Quine says the, the positivists cannot answer this. Now the second one is even more powerful because it's really getting to the heart of the issue whether positivists can really produce this logical language that they can, you know, verify all these meanings for all these theoretical terms. And the positivists said they could. But he just points out the very simple examples like the cat is brown or the dog is blue or whatever or the house is, you know, yellow. And he says to really try to cash these out, even these very simple empirical sense perception terms in a logical statement is really not possible. It's You could do it, but it would be so much effort, so strenuous, that it's not worth the time. So we're back to that this whole analytic synthetic distinction turns out to be a complete myth, and this belief that there's a logical language waiting to somehow salvage that myth was also a myth, hence the name. They're just two dogmas that positivists really think that they can force on people but don't really have any power. Now, in, um, in contrast to that picture, what Quine says, what we need to do is just abandon this 
notion of that these theoretical terms like truth, logic, or objectivity exist in a kind of metaphysical sense. So once we abandon this idea of metaphysical objectivity or realism, what, re what we recognize is that our scientific truths, even mathematical truths, are just pragmatic beliefs that happen to rest upon even larger sets of beliefs. So all we have are webs of beliefs that are sort of impinging upon one another. But this doesn't lead to anything bad because the, the, you know, this is kind of a circular argument, but it's a virtuous circle because we can't get out of it. As human beings, we just are stuck with running in between analytic and synthetic truths that we have to keep adjusting pragmatically based on our experience. As he puts it, we have to keep readjusting our web of beliefs given recalcitrant experience that we encounter every day. So it's a very much pragmatic argument. But where he differs with the pragmatists, he doesn't say we can just do whatever we like. There are going to be community standards, local standards, as well as the theories themselves have certain virtues that will recommend them to us. So you may say that you don't like The Last Jedi, and I do. You may think Picasso is a good artist. I don't. You may think mathematics is a more worthwhile pursuit than poetry. It seems like we can't even argue about these issues, but on Quine's understanding we can because we would still have various standards we can appeal to. Like a theory should be short, it should be elegant, it should be convenient, it should be useful. So even if truthhood in a kind of metaphysical platonic sense has been totally abandoned, we don't get rid of truth in any real sense. We still have truth in a scientific way because we want truths there because they're useful to our ways of being as human beings. So we're going to maintain truth in a scientific discourse because it's useful to do so. So of course we can have different communities and different individuals who will believe in tarot cards and, you know, soothsayers and things like that, fortune tellers. But most people being rational will opt for a more scientific discourse. So the way out of this is to just argue through the actual communal standards we have. We don't need these metaphysical entities to do the work.